This is part of the you, uh, the Lou, uh, rather, Lou Yu's uh, series uh, of lectures in which we deal with Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so uh, uh, this is uh, very special. Uh, I might mention that uh, this small room uh, is about to change in that uh, uh, we hope beginning in about uh, a couple of months at least, uh, all of this area is going to be renovated and we're going to have one large room here which covers nearly all of the second floor here. So we're going to be able to accommodate uh, much larger audiences. It's not a critical at the moment, but uh, it is something that we've uh, been wanting to do for a long time and, uh, and that should come to pass soon. Uh, uh, Wendy Chamberlain, our president, would normally want to be here to introduce uh, Robert, uh, but uh, she is, uh, guess what, in the Middle East uh, and uh, uh, doing good things for us. So I, I want to take no additional time here uh, just to say that, uh, uh, as I was saying to Robert just before, that uh, I haven't read the book yet. I'm looking forward to it, but I have read the article. Uh, the Atlantic uh, article. And if you have, you know how rich that is in the kind of detail that uh, even someone like myself, and I was doing the intelligence analysis in the State Department at the same time, that period that, that Robert was uh, covering, and he was filling in so many blanks for me uh, that I, uh, I realized that uh, uh, I, I had to read, obviously had to read the book as well. Well, I'm sure you'll agree with me about about the insights and the and the information which he's able to convey to us here to help us better understand uh, the countries involved and and particularly uh, the Taliban. So before I say anything more, I want to introduce Robert Grenier, please. Thanks very much, Marvin. Our story begins early on a Sunday morning. It was the 23rd of September, 2001, to be precise. I was sound asleep in my bedroom in Islamabad, Pakistan. It was actually more of a safe haven. It was behind bolted steel doors. I was absolutely exhausted. I'd only been asleep for about three hours. And the phone rings. It was the secure phone on my nightstand. And I knew it had to be somebody from Langley. For God's sake, what do they want now? And so there was probably more than a hint of irritation in my voice when I picked up the phone. And I said, hello. And there was a pause at the other end of the line. And a voice said, did I wake you up, son? Good God. It's the director. So I did the only thing I could do under the circumstances. I lied. I said, no, no, Mr. Director, I was just getting up. And he said, look. Now, remember, this is early Sunday morning, my time. It's late Saturday evening, late Saturday night, his time. He said, look, we have a meeting early tomorrow at Camp David. The principals are going to be meeting the war cabinet. And we're going to be discussing the war plan for Afghanistan. He said, the Pentagon is telling us that there are very few military targets of any sort in all of Afghanistan. We know where the terrorist training camps are, but they're empty. The terrorists have all fled. And he literally asked me, should we bomb empty camps? This is the 23rd of September, 12 days after 9-11, the, the worst one-day disaster in American history since Pearl Harbor. And George Tenet, the director of Central Intelligence, at the heart of power in Washington, is bypassing the entire chain of command to call me 
and ask what we should do. If you didn't know we were in trouble before, I knew we were in trouble now. So I said, look, Mr. Director, I, I'm not sure we're thinking about this the right way. This isn't primarily a military problem. This is a political problem. At the end of the day, what we need in Afghanistan is a responsible government that can control its territory and that will keep the country from remaining what it is now, which is a terrorist safe haven. We can probably chase out bin Laden and the Arabs. And by the way, in those days, we never talked about Al-Qaeda. We referred to Al-Qaeda the way the Afghans did. It's the Arabs. Bin Laden's Arabs. The Arab Afghans. I said, we can chase out bin Laden and, and the Afghan Arabs. But unless there's a responsible political authority on the ground, there's nothing to keep them from coming back. At the end of the day, Afghans have to do this. Unless we're pro proposing to colonize the country. And I couldn't imagine that anyone was going to propose that seriously. So we started to talk it through. And he was asking me questions. And I, I said, look, Mr. Director, this, this is taking too much time. Let me just write this all down. He said, that's a good idea. He said, it's late here. I'm tired. The helicopter is picking me up at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning to go to Camp David. Can you get something to me by then? I said, yes, sir, I can. So I drove into the office, sat down, banged out an eight-page message in about three hours. By this time, my senior lieutenants were coming in. I distributed it to them, got suggestions from them, made some, made some changes, and sent it off to George Tenet's security detail with instructions to hand it to him as soon as he woke up. He did. He looked at it. He sent copies to the other members of the War Cabinet, to Rumsfeld and Powell and Rice and Cheney, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And early that morning, Sunday morning, they got together and they discussed it. And the following day, Monday, they met with the President in the Situation Room and they laid it out for him and he said, done. This is the template for our effort. And Tenet said, okay, I will put Grenier in touch with General Tommy Franks, the commander of CENTCOM at the time, commander of U.S. forces. We're going to be dealing with this problem and make sure that his battle plan confirms with the template that we've just agreed. Now, I didn't know any of this was happening. I just sent this message off. The next thing I knew, it was Monday afternoon, my time, and they said, in two hours' time, we're going to have a secure video conference with General Franks. He wants to hear what the plan is. And he wasn't terribly happy to be getting a plan from me. So, what did this message say? Well, as I'd started in the first place, it said that, look, this is not a military problem. We need to use military means in a calibrated way to produce, at the end, what we hope will be the, the political solution that we need. At the end of the day, there has to be a competent authority in Afghanistan that can preclude Afghanistan's again becoming a terrorist safe haven. And if that can be the Taliban, so much the better. If Mullah Omar won't cooperate and another faction within the Taliban will, well then that's just fine too. We should back them. But if no one in the Taliban will do what's necessary, then we have to smash what's there and hope that we can put something together again to replace the Taliban. And God only knew what that was going to look like. So I said, we have to start with Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar will not change policy. Then we hit Mullah Omar as an object lesson to the others. And if they won't cooperate, then we hit them as well and on down the Taliban. And if we have to turn to an outside authority, as most likely we will, we have to be very careful. Because the temptation will be to just come in as parties to a civil war to back the Northern Alliance against the Taliban. Well, number one, the Northern Alliance wasn't going to be able to go far south of Kabul because they just didn't have the tribal support in the Pashtun areas of the country. But also, under circumstances where there is right now a tremendous amount of dissidence among the Pashtuns against the Taliban, we must not appear to be coming in on behalf of the Northern Alliance exclusively because then we risk having all of the Pashtuns recoalesce around the Taliban and making the situation worse now than it was before. And remember, I said we're dealing with Afghans. 
Scratch an Afghan and you find a xenophobe. We mustn't appear as though we are invading the country. We know what the Afghans have done with invaders in the past. Therefore, Afghans have to be in front. We need to be supporting the correct uh, Afghan factions and not try to do it the other way around. We mustn't seem like an invading army. God forbid that we should ever seem like an occupying army. We, we must make it very clear that we have no desire for permanent military bases. The U.S. military footprint has to be very, very small. Those were the principles that, in fact, we followed during what we thought at the time was the Afghan war. So most of this story has to do with that campaign. Now, we were fortunate at that point that, in fact, I and my station had been spending many months trying to organize a tribal rebellion against the Taliban. Now, we couldn't launch it because you have to have a, a presidential finding in order to do that. But we had reached out to as many of the old Mujahideen commanders as we possibly could. Many of them were, were tribal leaders, warlords, people who had been pushed aside by the Taliban, who were waiting for an opportunity to come back. Certainly had no brief for the Taliban, although some of them were, were still fighting for them against the Northern Alliance. And so now after 9-11, we reached out to them one after another, and we said, look, this is your opportunity. We know you want to overthrow the Taliban. Well, now, if you will rise up against them, you'll have the full weight of U.S. military power behind you. But almost to a person, they demurred. We heard an endless list of excuses. Being experienced in warfare in Afghanistan, they weren't going to enter a, enter a fight unless they knew they had a very good chance of winning. They wanted to make sure that we were serious. What are you actually doing militarily against the Taliban? They were sitting firmly on the fence until they saw which way this thing was going to go. And there were only two tribal leaders of any consequence in the South who were willing to rise up and take the risk of opposing the Taliban openly. One of them was Hamid Karzai. Worked out fairly well for him in the end. Became the two-time president of Afghanistan. The other was Gulag Asherzai, who was a, a former governor of Kandahar. Had the, had the uh, dubious distinction of being the first provincial governor to be ousted by the Taliban when they rose to power beginning in, in 1994. And so most of, uh, much of this story is the improbable history of those two campaigns, of Hamid Karzai and Gulaga Shirzai. And it was not at all a foregone conclusion that they were going to win, even with our military support. History always seems to have a certain air of inevitability. Well, I can tell you there was no inevitability about this. And there were long periods of time when I would not have given a dime for Hamid Karzai's life as he was literally being chased from mountaintop to mountaintop in Uruzgan province. And it, in fact, at a certain point, just after he had won a, a significant victory, his tribal elders said, look, we're not sure that we can sustain this under the current circumstances. You have to get the Americans with you. Ask them to come in and take you to safety. And in fact, improbably, we were able to do that. And an individual by the name of Greg, who has since risen to glory, he's now the, the uh, as of a few days ago, the director of the National Clandestine Service. Well, he was my subordinate at the time. And fortuitously, I had assigned him to be the contact for Hamid Karzai. And I'm sure that I had excellent reasons for it. I, I just can't remember what they were. Um, but it turned out very, very well. And uh, he flew in on a JSOC helicopter. He gathered Hamid Karzai and six of his elders. They flew them out to Jacobabad and Pakistani Air Base. And then we tried to organize the campaign to get them back in with a small number of special forces operators who could marshal the efforts of the U.S. Air Force on his behalf. It was not an easy campaign, not by a long shot. And in fact, even after... Karzai's reinsertion, he came within a hair's breadth of death at, uh, at Tarin Kot, which is the provincial capital of Erzgan province. And eventually he was able to make his way south with the help of the CIA special forces in the US, and particularly the U.S. Air Force. And by the time he got to Kandahar, he had been elevated. He'd been selected at the Bonn Conference organized by the UN to be the interim chairman or to be the chairman of an interim government for Afghanistan. But by the time he arrived in Kandahar, 
Gulag Ashurze had already arrived ahead of him. In fact, the fact of the matter is Gulag Ashurze had very much the superior force. He had about 1,500 fighters by the time he arrived in Kandahar. I'm not sure that Hamid Karzai ever had more than 350. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, perhaps a little known fact. So he did not have overwhelming support, even in the Pashtun areas of the country from which he was drawn. And even with all the difficulties that we had, the, the victory that we won, first with the Northern Alliance and then with our tribal allies in the South, was deceptively easy. The Taliban, rather than fighting to the end, they surrendered, quote unquote, to Hamid Karzai. They evacuated Kandahar. It just all seemed too easy. And I can tell you that at the time, we didn't fully understand what was happening. We didn't fully understand why the Taliban had given up as it had. And therefore, we didn't understand just how fragile this so-called victory was. And we didn't understand the circumstances under which the Taliban might be able to reassert themselves. We thought they were a spent force. Turned out we were wrong. And we could catalog the mistakes that the U.S. government and our Afghan allies writ large made in those days, the years immediately following our so-called victory. In, this, in December of 2001. And we, the Americans, our focus was deflected elsewhere. We went to Iraq. I myself went back to Washington. I spent two and a half years as the mission manager for the, the CIA effort in Iraq. And by the time I came back to focus once again on Afghanistan and Pakistan, this time as the director of the counterterrorism center, I went out in the spring of 2005, made an extensive trip to both Pakistan and Afghanistan, and already we could begin to see that the situation was beginning to slip <coughs> away. The Taliban was beginning to reassert itself in the south and the east of the country. And then I would argue that we as a country made a very, very serious effort, a serious mistake. You remember those principles that we followed, sometimes to a fault during the first American-Afghan war. Well, now we forgot all of those. And basically, the U.S. took over the effort. We had 100,000 U.S. troops at its height, an additional 40,000 NATO troops. Robin can catalog all this a whole lot better than I can. We were spending over $100 billion a year. We completely overwhelmed this tiny, primitive, agrarian country. It was an effort that, frankly, particularly given the amount of time that we were willing to give it simply could not succeed. And in fact, it did not succeed. And now we see where we are now. U.S. combat forces have now departed Afghanistan. And having made what I regard as a major strategic error and having tried to do too much from 2005 onward, now I would argue that we are compounding that error by doing too little. I think that our current posture in Afghanistan is far too limited, far too timid. Having engaged in an unsustainable effort, we are now refusing to do what we can on a sustainable basis. And I think that there will be a price to be paid for that. So at the end of the day, this is a book that I have tried to write for a general reader. In the way that I experienced it, it's essentially an adventure story. But that adventure story is bracketed by a larger tale of what I would regard as geopolitical significance, how it was that we supposedly won the first American-Afghan war, how we lost, or at least certainly did not win the second American-Afghan war, and how I fear eventually we may be yet be drawn, be drawn into a third. The shift, there's been a shift in the global jihad. The front lines are now in Iraq and Syria, to a lesser extent in Yemen, Somalia. And although the situation for those who oppose what's now called the Islamic State is not particularly good or particularly encouraging, eventually I believe they're going to be rolled back. At the end of the day, they don't have the popular support that they need to prevail, I believe. And someday, in the not-too-distant future, these people who are drawn to this movement are going to be looking for another safe haven. And I greatly fear that they're going to find it in Afghanistan and perhaps 
even parts of Pakistan. So with that, let me throw things open to questions. Thank, thank you. Uh, I uh, was remiss in not introducing Robert Grenier uh, in the sense that I didn't mention about his uh, having thought that you all had read uh, his credentials. But uh, 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 Robert was the station chief in Islamabad with responsibility for Afghanistan and Pakistan during this critical period that we're talking about. Robert, I have one parallel. When you got your phone call right. from Director Tennant, about that same time, I remember being called uh, up into a skiff at, mm -hmm. at State. And on the table, agency people had come mm -hmm. there, and on the table they had laid out a the most enormous map of Kabul. Mm -hmm. And I and another fellow came in, we said, said to us, now tell us all the places we shouldn't bomb. <laughs> uh, because at that point, we thought we were going to have a, 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 a we were going to have trouble getting them out of Kabul. There was going to be, mm -hmm. my first thought was, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, the Afghans are not going to fight uh, if they feel that the tide has turned against them. If they, they always know which way the wind is blowing and they get out of the way. Right. Uh, well, that, so we never had to. But the reason I'm telling this is that you're talking about how little we knew. I said to myself, you mean I'm going to be responsible if this collateral because somehow I said this was safe and this was, why had I been asked? Because I lived in Kabul mm -hmm. years earlier and I had been there during the Taliban mm -hmm. while the Taliban were controlled for a short period of time. But I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it struck me how little they knew that they had to come to people like me mm -hmm. to ask this and how little I knew. So please, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take questions. Uh, uh, introduce yourself, uh, affiliation, however, and uh, keep short and specific. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Rutherford, and my question is, um, during Lone Survivor, at the end of it, we saw that the Pashtun had a, a cultural thing to take care of people in their care, mm -hmm. and would it not have been better to have used more diplomacy since our beef was with Al-Qaeda and not the Taliban? Yeah, I mean, that's like a lot of questions having to do with the situation. We, we will never know the answer. Uh, I, I had eight hours uh, of meetings with Mullah Osmani, who was the de facto number two figure in the Taliban at the time. He was the Southern Zone commander. He commanded all the, the troops in the south of Afghanistan. And uh, I had two meetings with him, again, uh, over a total of, uh, of eight hours. And I started in the beginning because I, I knew we actually we had very good intelligence on uh, intra-Taliban dynamics at the time. And I knew that he was one of the prominent figures who actually did not like bin Laden. There were lot, they had lots of reasons to resent bin Laden and the Arabs. And he was fairly vocal about it. And I was hoping that we could seize on that to get his support to convince Mullah Omar that he had to turn over bin Laden and drive out al-Qaeda. And we sat through the first meeting and he basically would not commit himself. And he said, we will carry this, we will carry your offer back to Mullah Omar. And when I met with him on the second occasion, by this time, Mullah Omar had made it crystal clear that he was not going to change policy with regard to bin Laden or al-Qaeda. So finally, I said to Mullah Osmani, you have to do it for just the reason that you've just suggested. I said, and, it, and he had said, look, Mullah Omar cannot turn his back on bin Laden. He's committed to, publicly to bin Laden. And we all know about uh, Pashtun Wali and you know, the, 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 uh, the requirement to, um, uh, to take care of anyone who, is, who, who has come under your, uh, under your protection. So I said, Mullah Omar has this obligation, but you don't. You need to, for the good of the movement, for the good of your country, you need to move Mullah Omar quietly aside, you, you need to hold him incom incommunicado. You need to seize control of the government and announce a, a change in policy. And he finally agreed to my amazement. 
Now, his agreement didn't last very long. Probably didn't last but a few minutes after he got back to, uh, to Kandahar. But it leaves open the question, would it have been, po if we'd had more time, would it have been possible to bring them around? And, and as, as the individual who tried his utmost, who thought that he was making at least some traction with Mullah Osmani, uh, we continued talking after the bombing started, by the way. Our, our conversations were considerably less friendly after the bombing started. But, you know, in all honesty, I mean, who knows? But in all honesty, I don't think that we could have done it. I don't think that they would have been persuaded. One of the things that I didn't fully realize at the time, but I came to learn later, was the almost mystical hold that Mullah Omar had over his people. He really did. I think he, he, he in the context of Pashtun culture, he was able to manipulate these people very, very effectively. He was at the center of the circle. All of the spokes led to governors, um, commanders, other senior people in the Taliban. Most of them didn't trust each other, but they all radiated back to Mullah Omar. And at the end of the day, I don't think any of them would have broken with him. But we'll never know. Robert, I, I just want to add to that. Pashtun culture and the reverence for the leader here, but also Islamic culture. Mm -hmm. Because he had portrayed himself as uh, as a as someone who wears the cloak of the prophet. Right, literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. He, right. uh, and uh, and the and was had an enormous respect, didn't he? Uh, he among did. people here for his piety. Yes. Uh, even though he was even then incommunicado most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, let's jump. Hi, uh, my name is Talat Malikzad. I'm with Voice of America Afghan Services. Mm -hmm. uh, my question just follows to the, the, the diplomacy. If diplomacy didn't work in 2001, what makes us think that it's going to work now? The fact that the State Department and White House are refusing to call Taliban terrorists and they're calling them oppos armed oppositions. Mm -hmm. That has changed in the past two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. What makes the, the White House to, to negotiate with them? And the fact this morning, uh, uh, Senator Tom Cotton was talking at USAP mm -hmm. and he he said that 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 they are terrorists. So there's mm -hmm. you could see that there's there's mm -hmm. this separate between between the, the legislative branch and executive branch. What makes the White House and the, mm -hmm. the new government of Abdullah Abdullah Ghani mm -hmm. do something about the, the mm -hmm. Taliban? Yeah, I, imagine the difference between the, the, the Congress and the executive. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's unprecedented. <laughs> um, I, I, I could tell stories. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, to my knowledge, there, we don't have active negotiations with, uh, with the Taliban. For, for some time, there were murky talks that were taking place, and we all know about you know, the, the agreement you know, involving the, the, uh, the gutteries. Um, I, I never thought that there was any real uh, hope for those discussions. I think that the Taliban, I think it was very significant, first of all, that the, the Taliban wanted to, well, they were willing to speak to the Americans. They didn't particularly want to speak with, with Hamid Karzai. Well, I talked to the puppet. Talk to the puppet master, in their view. So I don't think that they were ever really serious about negotiating in, in, in a negotiation properly so-called. I think they were willing to talk to us about the terms under which we would leave. That'd be fine. But I don't think they were ever really willing to negotiate with us. And frankly, I'm not sure they're really capable of it. Now, it, it's always dangerous to talk to somebody like me who's, whose primary experience is from years ago, because you, you tend to think that you're... That, you know, what you know is somehow frozen in time and is immutable. Well, you know, this may not be your father's Taliban. But from the insight that I've gathered, I, I don't think that they are really capable of negotiating in a, in a series. I, I can't imagine a Taliban, which is a member of a coalition government in Kabul. I, 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 just, I, don't, I just don't think they have the mentality. I mean, they think they're fundamentalists and they think in absolutist terms. <laughs> And uh, actually, uh, an individual whom, whom I've gotten to know since, uh, since the war, um, uh, uh, Salam um, uh, Zaif, who was the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, later spent five years in Guantanamo, I had the opportunity to speak with him on a number of occasions. And, and he doesn't think that they can do that, nor does he think that, that they should do that. He thinks that they need to be what they were back in the beginning, which is a, a, a religiously motivated social force. Um, so, 
but on, on this whole question of, well, are they terrorists, aren't they terrorists? Well, well, I mean, the Taliban as a movement have not been international terrorists. And I don't think they particularly cared, most of them, about you know the global jihad. They were focused on Afghanistan. Now, I think Mullah Omar, unfortunately, was an exception. As Marvin has just said, Mullah Omar, you know, he wrapped himself in the, in the cloak of the prophet. He, he called himself the commander of the faithful. I think he believed his PR. I think he saw himself as a world historical figure. I think he saw himself as bigger than bin Laden. Thank you very much. So I think he had a very different motivation. But the people around him, I don't think, shared that same motivation. But the, the real the, the, the problem here, to my view, is not so much that the Taliban are international terrorists. Now, God knows they, they, use, they use terrorist uh, methodologies now. I, I don't think that they themselves still are international terrorists, properly so-called, who, who have aspirations beyond Afghanistan or, or, or Pakistan. But by the same token, I don't think that they will say no to full-fledged international terrorists who come to them looking for support. I think they tend to, to, to view the world in a very binary way. Is, it, is this is a certain course dictated by Islam or not? And if you ask the question, you're going to get the answer. And I think the answer, if we're international terrorists are concerned, is always going to be yes. Yes. Galway. Yeah. <clears throat> Nehan Sari, uh, I'm a visiting researcher at Carnegie Endowment, originally from Pakistan. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but how oh, but you're going to do it anyway, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> how different do you think Afghanistan would have been if the United States had not gone to Iraq? I don't know if you all heard the question, how different might history have been if the U.S. hadn't gone to Iraq and, and we'd remain focused on Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, I, I think things would have been better. One of the things that shocked and disappointed me, among many other things, uh, during the, the time that I was, I had exposure to the highest levels of, of policymaking, was how difficult it is, even for the United States and all of its power and majesty, to do two things at once. I mean, there's only so much command attention. And I, I could see that there just wasn't very much attention that was being focused on Afghanistan. Again, I, I was spending all my days working on Iraq, but I would see the folks trooping out of the, the, the White House Situation Room meeting on Afghanistan. And I, I couldn't, so I was only vaguely aware of what was going on, but I, I couldn't imagine why the reconstruction effort was so slow in the beginning. I thought that we would have been all over this. I mean, why can't you just delegate authority and tell people just get this done? Come back to us when you have questions. It's very, very difficult for the U.S. government to do that. So had we not been distracted by Iraq, would we have done a better job? I think we would have done a better job. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that there was, given what was happening on the ground, and I think that the, 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 the history of what happened after our so-called victory at the end of 2001 is a very complicated one. And I think it, it's literally, you know, every district has its own story. But given what was happening on the ground politically in, in those localities, given the, the fact that we, the people whom, who were empowered as a result of the Taliban's having been defeated, were, um, took actions which, arose, which, which generated local opposition and created an opportunity for the Taliban. Given the fact that I would say we were making the perfect the enemy of the good, the fact that, that we would not uh, try to empower um, uh, relatively moderate and relatively responsible warlords, that we wouldn't make warlords the best warlords they could be, we're, but we're instead trying to create this centralized government with a centralized army that would somehow improbably, despite the fact that they would never have the resources to support it, uh, assert its control over the entire country. I think given those sorts of policies, it was inevitable that the Taliban would eventually reassert itself. And I don't think there's anything that our, that our preoccupation with Iraq would have caused us not to make the, what I would regard as, as the, the fundamental error that we made after 2005, which was to try to do too much, basically to make Afghans an afterthought. We decided that Afghanistan was too important to be left to Afghans, and uh, the result was, I think, predictable. Yes, go ahead. Wait for, wait for the mic, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sunny Busa, retired State Department, mm -hmm. and my daughter worked for you. Or did she? <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, she told me to be here and get your book. So, <laughs> uh, but now I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, with all the emphasis on ISIS right now, mm -hmm. wh what difference do you see in our approach towards ISIS and our approach towards the Taliban? Are we making the same mistakes? 
Uh, is, is the rhetoric the same? Or are we, have we gotten any smarter? Yeah, I, I think I think we've gotten at least marginally smarter, um, and I'm 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 very pleased. Uh, I think it's wise that the administration doesn't want to jump in with both feet. That that we we don't want to to put U.S. combat forces, conventional combat forces, on the ground uh, in Iraq, let alone let alone Syria. Uh, I, I think that we should be muscular in being engaged with forces on the ground, whether it's the Kurds, whether it's the the uh, the Iraqi army. Whether it's elements in uh, in Syria in in providing them with support to include air power, but here too we have to we have to walk a very very fine line. I, I am very disturbed when I hear as as once again I, we were hearing that this morning statements from the U.S. government about the U.S. led coalition against ISIS. If it is a U.S. led coalition, we already have two strikes against us because we are disempowering. Uh, those, I mean, you, you cannot be against Islam. You cannot be uh, an, an un-Islamic opposition if you want to have any kind of support anywhere in the Middle East and certainly in, in uh, Iraq and Syria. This has to be, as, as we advocated at the beginning of the Afghan campaign, this, this needs to be a Muslim effort. This is their fight at the end of the day. Now, we have a stake in the outcome, and we certainly should be uh, muscular in supporting those whom we can responsibly support against ISIS. But at the end of the day, it's their struggle, and we make a big mistake if we present it otherwise. Now, do I think that we should be using air power against them? Yes, absolutely. But again, when, when the air power is getting way out in front of the forces on the ground, it begins to look more and more like an American campaign. So I, I'm not saying that, that it's easy to calibrate this correctly. I'm just saying it needs to be calibrated, and, uh, and it's, it's very easy to, uh, to get this wrong. And um, just to elaborate on that a little bit further. You know, we, we said that we had to have Afghan allies. We, the Americans, had to support Afghan allies on the ground. Well, you know, in the South, we didn't have a lot of them. And, uh, and one of them, the most prominent of them, Hamid Karzai, was, was nearly killed on, on at least, well, on, on a, a number of occasions to include in a fratricidal bombing that we were responsible for just before, just before he entered Kandahar. Well, what if those two <clears throat> lone Pushtun commanders had not been available to oppose the Taliban. What then? We would have been in a situation in the south of Afghanistan very similar to the situation that we're facing in Iraq and Syria right now. The problem is that we do not have effective allies in either place. Things are considerably better in Iraq. They are, they are, they are not at all good in Syria. And the so-called Syrian moderate opposition is not going to overthrow the, the Bashar Assad regime, let alone ISIS. So we don't have a lot of good options there. And you know, I'm not at all smug about what we managed to accomplish in Afghanistan because we were very nearly in the same place. And while I think that we were wise in doing what we did in what I like to call the first American-Afghan war, we were also very, very lucky. Um, What's your assessment of the relationship between the Pakistani military and the ISI and the Afghan Taliban right now? Yeah, I, I get asked that a lot, yeah. <laughs> as you might imagine. And they say, oh, yeah, you and your friends in the ISI. Well, you're, you're. And, uh, and yes, I did have friends in the ISI, I admit it. Um, and, and we cooperated very, very effectively. One of the things I didn't mention in my, in my uh, statement up front was that at the same time that we were you know, fighting this war in Afghanistan, we were also conducting a parallel campaign within Pakistan because the Afghan Arabs, al-Qaeda, fled from Afghanistan as we were making progress against the, the Taliban. And we were working, we, CIA, American intelligence, the FBI were working hand in glove with the ISI to round these people up. And they, at the end of the day, they, they uh, accounted for better or for worse for a, a substantial portion of the population at, uh, at Guantanamo. We also captured a number of, of senior cadres of, uh, of Al-Qaeda, as we all know. So at, at the same time that we were cooperating very, very, very effectively with the ISI in, uh, in that part of the struggle, you could tell from very early on that their attitudes toward the Afghan Taliban were far more complicated. And when we would provide them with leads on al-Qaeda members, they were very, very effective at following up. We'd provide them leads on senior members of the Taliban Shura, and somehow their luck wasn't nearly as good. Go figure. Um, but 
very early on, they well, they knew. They knew Hamid Karzai. They didn't trust Hamid Karzai. They knew about his longstanding links with the Northern Alliance. They knew about the, the Northern Alliance's longstanding links with, uh, with India. And they didn't like the way this thing was going at all. And when I would talk to them about it, they would get very quiet. And so... Needless to say, their, their relations with the Afghan Taliban, which had always been very, very complicated, were not enhanced by the experience of the war in 2001, put it that way. And you look at this from a Taliban point of view. They had been betrayed by the Pakistanis. I, I doubt they've ever gotten over that. But by the same token, the Pakistanis wanted to maintain their options to the extent that they could, because they were very, very concerned, as we all know, about Indian influence in Afghanistan. So uh, I think that their desire, now do I think that they are actively backing the Afghan Taliban right now? No, I, I don't think they are. And as a matter of fact, ironically, I think that the uh, government officials in Pakistan will be the first to tell you honestly that a, an outright victory by the Taliban over the government in Kabul and consolidation of their power over Afghanistan would be a disaster for Pakistan. I mean, they, they are many things, but they are not naive. And they know that the, the elements of the Pakistani Taliban are, abs are, are um, adamant and they want to overthrow the, the regime in, in Islamabad if they possibly can. And they also know that these people will have a, uh, a, a sympathetic uh, relationship with the Afghan Taliban if and when the Afghan Taliban are in a position to provide it. In fact, we've already seen it. We, we've seen uh, elements of, of the Pakistani Taliban take refuge in Afghanistan. That can only get worse if the, the Pakistani, or rather if, if the Afghan Taliban prevail in Afghanistan. So this is a very, very complicated situation. And I think from the U.S. point of view, we, we have tended to view this in very black and white terms. You're with us or you're against us. Um, we have been very upset by what we have, have considered to be the, the, the tacit tolerance at, at, a very, at a minimum uh, that the Government in Islamabad has shown four militants who are engaged in cross-border hostilities inside Afghanistan. Well, from the Pakistani point of view, putting myself in their shoes, they're saying, look, we, we've, we've got troubles enough of our own, thank you very much. These guys are crossing the, uh, the border and attacking you. That's unfortunate, but that's your problem. We don't need to look for more trouble. And God forbid that they should ever combine forces against us. So you know, we may not like it. We didn't like it back when we had active U.S. combat forces in Afghanistan, but and at the end of the day, you have to understand that Pakistanis now, as they always have in the past, are going to follow what they seem to see to be their national interest and not ours. Okay, John. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Robert. Look forward to reading your book. Uh, my name is John Evans. I'm with the Brookings Institution, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also an active duty Army colonel and uh, spent plenty of time in Afghanistan, some of those times when you were there as well. Mm -hmm. Greg's a friend of mine, so mm -hmm. a big admirer of his. Yeah. I got two questions for you, actually. Um, uh, number one, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the nexus between the Haqqani Network and the Taliban, and how mm -hmm. that's working? Mm -hmm. Are we starting to see that degrade or erode any? Do we believe that's going to be strengthened now that U.S. presence has been drawn back a little bit? Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask you to put on your hypothetical glasses one more mm -hmm. time and, uh, and, and opine a little bit on how much different, if different at all, you would see Afghanistan today had uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud not been assassinated two days before 9-11. Mm -hmm. Who would we have picked to be the leader of Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. uh, would it have been him or, or Karzai? So. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's... it's um, with many questions, there are others who are probably a lot more qualified to answer them than I am. Uh, but with regard, first of all, to the Haqqani network, I, I don't claim any great insight into Haqqani. I, I knew that, well, uh, uh, as I mentioned in, in the book, um, Haqqani was one of the, Jalaluddin, the, the old man, was one of the people that we approached before 9-11, hoping that we could suborn him into opposing, opposing the Taliban. And uh, he... I can't remember how, how many you know, lakh rupees it was that he wanted, but it was the equivalent of, of uh, 80,000 U.S. dollars, which he wanted just to sit down and speak to us. Well, my mother didn't raise a complete fool. So uh, needless to say, that meeting never took place. But uh, Haqqani, almost uniquely among Mujahideen commanders or elements in the, within the Taliban, mind you, really was committed 
to Al Qaeda. He, uh, he he'd married, I think, one or two Syrians. He actually had close personal relations with elements in, in Al Qaeda that that uh, that very few did. So I think he was always uh, committed to Al Qaeda, and if you will, through them, the, the the global jihad in a way that others were not. And uh, there were some after the after the the war, as we thought was over, uh, thought that he could somehow be drawn back into the fold. I, I never thought so. I mean, I, I I would have hoped for it, but I I never ever thought so. And I don't think it's an accident, therefore, that he has been willing to uh, to engage in uh, activities against the, the the putative enemies of their brand of Islam to a far greater extent, for instance, attacks on the on the, the Indian embassy in Kabul than others have. So I, I, I think that he is he is certainly in line with the Afghan Taliban. I think maybe uh, it, he is more personally devoted to the global jihad than, than most of them are, uh, but he's also a very independent actor and his family are very independent actors. Uh, and I, I see him uh, being... I see him being more, if you're an element in the global jihad, than than the others are. But I don't see the, so that he may be he may be more of may more like the Taliban than the Taliban itself. But I don't think that um, uh, I don't think there's any any daylight between him and uh, and them. And I, I don't I don't foresee his being a, a problem for them if they are able to uh, to reassert their their control over um, even over uh, northern parts. Of the country, so I don't know if that helps to answer your uh, your question or not. And, and the second part had to do with with, with, with Ahmed uh, Shah Massoud. Well, you know, I, you know, I I don't know. I, I think it was very important, and I think that uh, those who gathered at Bonn were wise to select a Pashtun to try to uh, to reunify the country. Now, I think there would have been a tremendous sentiment uh, for uh, for Massoud simply because he was he was Massoud. Uh, and we all know just just how significant he was, and and, and what a what, what a uniquely talented individual he was, uh, what an intellectual he was, and I think he was somebody who was also committed in his own way to uh, uh, to reunifying uh, Afghanistan. So it would have been interesting to to see if it was between him and uh, and Hamid Karzai, how this whole thing uh, would have gotten. I I think that it would have gone. It would have been I think far better for us to have an Ahmed Shah Massoud to deal with than a Marshal Fahim. Um, you know, for for a whole host of reasons. So, but would would history have been fundamentally different as a result? I'm 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 skeptical. Robert, given mm -hmm. the um, the dislike for Masood among the Pashtuns, mm -hmm. was there a possibility that the aftermath of getting rid of the Taliban mm -hmm. would have been the potential for a civil war? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've always you know amazed at the even to this day, mm -hmm. how Pashtuns uh, view Ahmad Shah Massoud as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as the devil. Mm -hmm. uh, so was, was, did you ever feel that if it was not handled carefully, that you could have another conflict among the Afghans themselves, even immediately after uh, the exit of the Taliban? Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I, I was amazed. I, and I thought the the potential for a, a slightly qualitatively different civil war, but still a civil war uh, in the aftermath of the struggle was, was far greater than in fact it proved to be at least initially. And I, yeah, and, I, and, and it's, it's perhaps true that had Massoud lived that it would have been more difficult to put together a, uh, a, a relatively unified um, uh, uh, political system inside Afghanistan. And one of the things that amazed me, there were, there were two things that amazed me. I, I was very concerned about what would happen in Kabul uh, if and when the Northern Alliance swept in. And I was one of the people, you know, from, from the margins who was saying, look, we, we, to the extent that we can, we should keep the Northern Alliance from occupying Kabul. Uh, and among other things, I, I was afraid that there was going to be a, a, just a bloodbath. I thought there was going to be tr tremendous uh, revenge taking, and, and there were there was some of that in di uh, different parts of the of the country, up around uh, Mazar, for instance. But but not nearly as much as I would have expected, and as I feared. And I think that there was a much greater sense among Afghans of all stripes that you know we must not repeat the mistakes 
of the past. Everyone had seen what happened to the country when you know the, the Mujahideen commanders uh, fell to fighting uh, amongst themselves after the the, uh, the withdrawal of the Soviets, and and there was a, a, p- a palpable sense in the country that we we don't want to repeat that mistake again. And so I was amazed at how responsible Afghans really were. Hmm. Um, so, it, but you know, uh, had those things taken place, had there been a bloodbath in Kabul, if Massoud had still been uh, it's still been the, the, the commander of the Northern Alliance. Um, would it have been far more difficult than it initially proved to be to, to, to put together at least a nominally uh, unified uh, uh, political structure in, in Afghanistan? Perhaps, perhaps. And so, I, I, again, I thought we were very fortunate. And again, it, it led to this to this sense that because remember back in, in the beginning, uh, I was terrified. You know, back when George Tennant spoke to me in the first place, I thought, oh, my God, you know, here we go again. This is going to be like the British and, and the Soviets. We're going to end up in an open-ended guerrilla war uh, chasing an evanescent enemy. And God knows how this thing is going to turn out. And once we get in, how do we ever get back out again? Um, but in fact, something not unlike that did eventually happen, but not in the beginning. And uh, and when when that didn't happen, when Afghans did not immediately after the December of 2001 fall to fighting uh, against themselves again, the, the, the civil war didn't start again. We saw what, what was amazingly um, constructive behavior on the part of, of virtually all of the Afghan factions uh, at the time. I was seduced into thinking that maybe our initial fears had been wrong all along and that maybe there, there could be a whole new chapter for Afghanistan. And um, that, that proved should, not to be we, the should case. Should we give Hamid Karzai perhaps some mm-hmm. uh, hold him in this sense a good sense responsible mm-hmm. for the fact that it didn't happen. I, 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 again, I think that in many ways Hamid Karzai was an ideal choice. He was arguably the only real choice at the time that, that he was uh, elevated to, to be the, the interim chairman. And uh, and yes, I mean he he adhered to policies that he had advocated all along. He really was a voice for unity. Uh, among Afghans, and uh, and he, he put a lot of his differences with uh, with the Northern Alliance, um, to the extent that, that he had them um, uh, aside. And uh, I think he he gave himself and his country, uh, and by extension us, the opportunity for a whole new chapter in Afghanistan. And I think it it would have taken a great deal more collective wisdom, not only on our part, but but much more importantly on the part of of Afghans to sustain that. Um, but at the end of the day, it, that did not prove possible. Yeah, over here. Hi, Khaled the Deary at, at Johns Hopkins Science. Um, you, you characterize the the kind of the pre two thousand five period, post two thousand one, pre two thousand five mm-hmm. um, period is kind of relatively in relatively benign terms. Mm-hmm. But you know, maybe my reading would suggest that uh, it was. Precisely at that time, that uh, that Washington really, really wasn't focused at all on the reconstruction effort, mm-hmm. um, and kind of, you know, the disjunction between the the, the peacekeeping mission there and the uh, Al Qaeda mission there, the U.S. was really taking the latter, you know, the latter approach. Didn't really resource uh, ISAF, and at that time, mm-hmm. which was various countries were leading were leading uh, ISAF in different parts of the country, mm-hmm. but. Uh, wasn't really focused on that peacekeeping um, and security uh, element. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you mentioned the south of the country and Uruzgan at that time, I think in 2003, there were about 300 police officers for the whole province, mm-hmm. poorly trained, of course, but 300 facing about 1,000 Taliban. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that time doesn't seem to me like a particularly benign one. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of uh, of, of being able to address the root causes of the, the conditions under which the Taliban were to emerge. Mm-hmm. And then a second aspect of that is, of course, Pakistan as well. Um, the realization of what Pakistan was interested in in Afghanistan was, seemed to me not really a, a focus of U.S. foreign policy at that time. Um, could, you, could you restate that? It, it seems to me that the, the recognition of what Pakistan's core interests in Afghanistan were, right. were being really addressed by right. American foreign policy at that time. So I guess mm-hmm. my general critique would be um, addressing the conditions under which, you know, uh, a competent or responsible Afghan government was not in place, mm-hmm. was never really addressed. Right. Yeah. I, I think that, that that period from the end of 2001 until uh, 2005 was a relatively 
benign period in the sense that there there was not active hostility, and we did have the the, the opportunity to try to create a more sustainable, positive political dispensation in Afghanistan. It became an unrealized opportunity, but the opportunity was there. And right after I returned from Pakistan in the summer of 2002, uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with me next. And so I had time on my hands and I wrote a, a piece for George Tenet. And what I advocated was, uh, what I said in effect was, look, we, and I, this is for the CIA after all. So I, I said, look, we, the CIA, we have a tremendous amount of influence uh, over a, a large number of factions, uh, both in the North and, and particularly in the South is where I was focused because that, after all, that, that was the, the homeland of, of the Taliban. And in effect, what I was arguing was that we should try to make warlords the best warlords that they could be, that we should accept the way power is usually expressed uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we we had teamed up uh, effectively with a limited number of Pashtun warlords uh, in uh, in the south. Uh, I felt that if if we as the U.S. government remained engaged with them, that if, if we had uh, the U.S. military, the CIA, AID, the Department of State all working in conjunction with uh, people with, who had legitimate influence in their respective areas uh, and tried to foster at least some tenuous link between them and uh, and the center, tried to, you know, with a great deal of knowledge of local tribal politics, try to make them as, um, as uh, answerable and, and as accountable to uh, the local tribes other than their own, that we would have at least the opportunity to to create in, in significant parts of the country a relatively stable political situation. Instead, we took a very very different tone. And I would I would after I left, I was asking my my, my military friends. I'd say, well, look, you know, what 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 about you know the, the militias in different parts of the country? Well, they, they didn't want those to be sustained. They said, no 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 no, that's that's the old way. That's that that's what led us to this problem in the first place. We need to build up a centralized Afghan army that that can extend its its control over the whole country. I never thought we could do that. Or if we did it, I didn't think we, it could be sustained because sooner or later. The, the Americans are going to get sick of spending $100 billion a year in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is going to have to survive on its own resources. How can they possibly sustain that kind of a centralized military or, for that matter, police force? It has to be done at the local level. And we can't do it in all places uh, 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 all the time and all at once. But in significant parts of the country, I felt that that we could. And that, that I think, is the opportunity that uh, that we missed there. With regard to uh, Pakistan and, uh, and and their and w what clearly became again their policy with regard to uh, the, the Afghan Taliban. My, my feeling, and I, a lot of this you can lay at uh, at my feet because I, I was there for the first half of uh, of two thousand two. We were working uh, very closely with uh, with the ISI still to uh, to, uh, to pick up uh, members of um, uh, of Al Qaeda and and. Uh, I knew that they were not responsive to my request with regard to the, the Taliban. Number one, our, our intelligence was not particularly focused on the Taliban anymore. We were focused like a laser beam on Al-Qaeda. And I wanted to continue to sustain our efforts and our success against Al-Qaeda. And I, I, I didn't want to uh, undermine our relationship with the Pakistani government or uh, particularly with the, with the ISI, trying to get them to do something I knew they wouldn't do at the end of the day and somehow poisoning the atmosphere and keeping us from accomplishing what I felt we could accomplish with regard to Al-Qaeda. So as far as I was concerned, look, you know, if, if we collectively, and, and this is primarily the Afghans, if, if, if we and they are are wise, we can sustain this victory in Afghanistan, irregardless of what Pakistani policy is. Let's focus on what we know is there and doable and that we can we can convince the Pakistanis to help us with and let's not make, you know, once again, the, the perfect enemy of the good. We're pretty much running out of time, but we'll take one last question back here. You're going to ask us. Um, Eleanor Bachrock, I served with USAID in Kabul from 2008 to 2009, mm. was pessimistic when I went in, more so when I left. Mm. Um, sort of a tripartite question about leadership. Uh, uh, clearly our relationship with Karzai deteriorated steadily over time. Uh, uh, what do you consider to be the major factors? Uh, is the current uh, 
are we likely to do any better with the current government? And if the Taliban take over, which is quite likely, do you think they'll be any more moderate and interested in governing? Mm. Uh, those are three very important questions. Um, with, with, and, and, the, and the first one was deteriorating relationship. Oh, with, uh, with Hamid Karzai. Yeah, there are others, certainly, um, including some people in this room, I'm sure, who know Hamid Karzai better uh, than I do. I, I knew him, I got to know him, uh, you know, in, uh, in 2001. Uh, I would be called in uh, on occasion to have uh, you know, little Dutch uncle talks with Hamid uh, when there were certain points when we thought he was, he was starting to, to go off the rails. It's a very, very interesting figure, I think. It re and even then, he became more mercurial as time went by. He was mercurial even then. Um, but a very, very interesting guy, a, tremend a, 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 a tremendously courageous individual. I, I, I still do have a tremendous respect for Hamid Karzai. Um, but I think that, and again, most, for most of the time that you're talking about, I was viewing it from the outside. Um, but I, I guess I would put my finger on, on a, a few factors. One was, uh, during the time that the U.S. was so heavily committed in Afghanistan, it was not easy to be Hamid Karzai. It was not easy to be the president of, of Afghanistan. It was very, very difficult not to appear. In fact, it was impossible not to appear, and it must have been very difficult not to feel like a puppet. I mean, dealing with, with the Americans, with the overwhelming influence that they had in what, Af at the end of the day, was his country, must have just been excruciatingly difficult. And you can understand how that would weigh on him over time. The fact that the Taliban wouldn't deal with him, they didn't have the respect to even recognize him as, as a, a power and authority in the country. Okay, fine, they're your enemies, you don't expect to be treated well. That must have really, that must have really uh, graded on him enormously, especially given that the way that he was being treated at the same time by the Americans. And then I think what was probably very, very galling for him was the fact that there were certain things that he felt he had to do in the context of Afghan politics to survive in power. And they did not conform to our notions of good governance as, you know, maybe practiced in bucolic parts of Ohio. But, you know, th this was Afghanistan at the end of the day. He had to be able to survive. Uh, and, you know, you, you take a look at at the history of American politics in Chicago and South Texas, and it, it, you know, you, you can begin to understand, at least by analogy, you know, why it might have been difficult for him to adhere to, you know, a uh, a, a good governance policy. So again, not not to be an apologist for Hamid Karzai, I, I think that uh, that we we have been, I think, somewhat unfair in uh, in judging him, and and have not fully appreciated the extent to which our relationship with him tended to undermine him. And, and uh, I, I can understand why he became as emotional uh, as he did, particularly toward the end. Um, with regard to, uh, I remember the, the third part of your question that we had to do with the, hmm? the current Yeah, um, well, I, obviously, I, I think that, that, that the current government, uh, whatever else you want to say about them, they don't have some of the bag the baggage that, uh, that Hamid Karzai did. Uh, to the end, but uh, they, they are still faced with the same objective situation that he was. They they know that at the end of the day, they cannot entirely prevail politically against the Taliban. At least at least as things are right now, doesn't mean things are going to remain frozen in time. Things are always going to evolve. But as things are right now, they are in a, a very similar situation to the one that faced him. They cannot politically prevail against the Taliban, and yet the Taliban will not negotiate with them. And at the end of the day, what would, what realizable end would they achieve in negotiating with the Taliban? So this, this is an enormously difficult situation for them. Um, and uh, I, I think history is going to have to take its course. I think that politics will find its own level eventually. But what's critical is that, in my view, is that the, the international community, particularly the United States, remain committed to at least ensuring that the Kabul regime will not be overwhelmed by the Taliban. If we can, and I, I think that we can, with a sustainable policy, at least to make sure that they won't be defeated. I would like to see us be more muscular still and help them to engage in counterinsurgency in the areas that are within their natural ambit of control, help them to engage in insurgency in those areas that are within the Taliban ambit. And over time, people are going to figure out that we, we don't want to do this forever. And I think that the Taliban 
one hopes it will eventually become more of a social uh, religious movement once again with tremendous influence, but not actually not actually ruling the country. And that eventually you'll have a sort of a de facto uh, modus vivendi between the government in Kabul and 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 large parts of Taliban dominated uh, Afghanistan, where essentially the the government, the central government, will be saying, "Don't attack us, and we'll leave you alone." That's what I think is probably the uh, the best case scenario, but it's going to take a long time, I think, to to get us there. And the, and the, I'm sorry, the third part of your question, which was. Well, given the power of the Taliban in our retreat, um, yeah. what if the yeah. what if the Taliban yeah, does so it, take I, over? I I will it be as bad? Inadvertently or worse? answered at least uh, at least part of your of your question. Um, yeah, I mean the, the the Taliban are not really good governance types. There there are some things that they're really good at. Um, uh, uh, justice, they're really good at that. Um, you know, they're maybe it may not be uh, very attractive by our lights but it is it is certain it is sure and is relatively uh, impartial um i think that the, the taliban has become even more brutal uh th than it, it was before and we, we all know what they did to, to the hazaras we, we saw the things that they did up in mazar sharif we saw what they did to, uh, to najibullah uh, but th they have become uh, even more brutal since and they have used i think terrorist tactics against their own people uh, properly so called, in order to uh, to uh, extend their their influence in uh, particularly in the south and the east, and and I think that has that has further warped that organization. Um, so no, I, if if they were able to reassert their their control over the entire country, um, I I do not think that 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 would be uh, very comfortable. It would clearly be a, a strategic disaster for ourselves, and even more so for the uh, for the Pakistanis. And I think ultimately we would be drawn in one way uh, or another uh, to try to support those who are willing uh, to uh, to oppose the Taliban. And one thing that, that we do know about the Taliban is that wherever they have control, eventually they wear out their welcome. And there will be some individuals who do have legitimate tribal or other sources of, of influence and legitimacy who um, at, uh, at the end of the day will be willing to put their heads up and to oppose them, particularly if they have the prospect for some sort of support. Thank you, Robert Grenier, for uh, a across-the-board uh, discussion here. Uh, the book deals with a more uh, more narrow part of this story, mm -hmm. but from what you get in the book, I think you can better understand, certainly, some of the developments we're seeing now. Now, the book is going to be available here at a very reasonable price of $20, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and uh, Robert has uh, agreed to a sign. So we welcome you up front here, but before you do that, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>